Thank you, Madsen, very much indeed for that kind introduction. It's a, a huge honour to be giving this lecture, and uh, um, I uh, am in awe of being able to, to stand um, and talk about Adam Smith a little bit um, as someone who hardly heard the words Adam Smith until he was about 25. It's weird that you can go through an entire education in this country and not really be told about the ideas <coughs> of this man. Um, I've called my lecture Adam Darwin to stress how congruent the philosophies of Adam Smith and Charles Darwin are. The common theme, of course, is emergence, uh, the idea that order and complexity can be bottom-up phenomena. Both economies and ecosystems emerge. But my point, my purpose is really to explore not just the history uh, and evolution of this shared idea, but its future. To show that in, an, in the age of the internet, Adam Darwinism is the key to understanding how the world will change. First, the history. Darwin's debt to the political economists is considerable. He spent formative years in Edinburgh among the ghosts of Hume and Hutchison and Ferguson and Smith. When he was at Cambridge in 1829, he wrote, my studies consist in Adam Smith and Locke. At his uncle Josiah Wedgwood's house in Staffordshire, he often met the lawyer and laissez-faire politician Sir James Mackintosh, whose daughter married Darwin's brother-in-law and had an affair with his brother. <laughs> On the Beagle, he read the naturalist uh, Henri Milne Edwards, uh, who took Adam Smith's notion of the division of labour and applied it to the organs of the body. After seeing a Brazilian rainforest, Darwin promptly reapplied the same idea to the division of labour among specialised species in an ecosystem. Quote, the advantage of diversification in the inhabitants of the same region is in fact the same as that of the physiological division of labour in the organs <coughs> of the same individual body, a subject so well elucidated by Milne Edwards. Back in England in the 1830s, through his brother Erasmus, Darwin fell in with the radical novelist Harriet Martineau, who had shot to fame because of her series of short fictional books called Illustrations of Political Economy. These were intended to educate people in the ideas of Adam Smith, whose excellence, she once said, is marvellous. So much time did Erasmus and Charles Darwin spend with Harriet Martineau that their father worried that one of them might marry this firebrand feminist, the daughter of a ruined Norwich cotton manufacturer who lived by her pen. Fortunately for Robert Darwin, who wanted a more conventional daughter-in-law, Charles was astonished to find out how ugly she is. <laughs> well, I don't think she looks too bad in this picture. Whereas Erasmus was not the marrying kind. I believe it was probably at Martineau's suggestion that in October 1838, Darwin came to reread Malthus, a person with whom Martineau was on very close terms, and of course to have his famous insight that death must be a non-random and therefore selective force. Parenthetically, it's worth recalling the role of anti-slavery in bringing Martineau and Darwin together. Darwin's grandfather, Josiah Wedgwood, was in effect one of the leaders and organisers of the anti-slavery movement, a friend of Wilberforce and the maker of the famous medallion Am I Not a Man and a Brother, which was the emblem of the anti-slavery movement. Charles Darwin's aunt, Sarah, gave more money to the anti-slavery movement than any woman in Britain. Darwin had been horrified by what he called the heart-sickening atrocities of slavery in Brazil. So abolition was sort of almost the family business. Meanwhile, Harriet Martineau had just toured America speaking against slavery and had become so notorious that there were plans to lynch her in South Carolina. Today, to a bien pensant intellectual, it might seem surprising to find such a left-wing cause alongside such a right-wing enthusiasm for markets. But it should not. So long as the shadow cast by top-down determinism of Karl Marx with his proposal that the state should be the source of reform and welfare, that it's often forgotten how radical the economic liberalism of the political economists seemed in the 1830s. In those days, to be suspicious of a strong state was to be left-wing, and if you'll forgive the pun, quite right too. Today, generally, Adam Smith is claimed by the right Darwin by the left. 
In the American red states, where Smith's emergent decentralized philosophy is all the rage, Darwin is often reviled for his contradiction of dirigiste creationism. In the average British university, by contrast, you will find fervent believers in the emergent decentralized properties of genomes and ecosystems who nonetheless demand dirigiste policy to bring up the order to the economy and society. Yet if the market <coughs> needs no central planner, why should, need, why should life need an intelligent designer or vice versa? Where Smith has defen defenestrated Leviathan, Darwin defenestrated God. Even in this country, I find myself quite lonely in admiring both Smith and Darwin. Ideas evolve by descent and modification just as species do, and the idea of emergence is no exception. Darwin at least partly got the idea from the political economists, who got it from the empirical philosophers. To put it crudely, Locke and Newton begat Hume and Voltaire, who begat Hutchison and Smith, who begat Malthus and Ricardo, who begat Darwin and Wallace. Darwin's central proposition was that faithful reproduction, occasional random variation, and selective survival can be a surprisingly progressive and cumulative force. It can gradually build things of immense complexity. Indeed, it can make something far more complex than a conscious, deliberate designer ever could. With apologies to William Paley and Richard Dawkins, it can make a watchmaker. Each time a baby is conceived, 20,000 genes turn each other on and off in a symphony of great precision, building a brain of 10 trillion synapses, each refined and remodeled by early and continuing experience. To posit an immense intelligence capable of comprehending such a scheme rather than a historical emergent process is merely to exacerbate the problem. Who designed the designer? Likewise, as Leonard Reed pointed out, each time that a pencil is purchased, tens of thousands of different people collaborate to supply the wood, the graphite, the knowledge, and the energy without which, without any one of them knowing how to make a pencil. Says Smith, if you like, this came about by bottom-up emergence, not top-down dirigism. In both cases, nobody's in charge. And crucially, nobody needs to understand what's being done. Now, so far, I'm treading a fairly well-trodden path in the steps of Herbert Spencer, Friedrich Hayek, Karl Popper, and many others who have explored the parallels between evolutionary and economic theory. But the story has grown a lot more interesting in the last few years, I think, because of developments in the field of cultural and technological evolution. Thanks especially to the work of three anthropologists, Rob Boyd, Pete Richardson, and Joe Henrik, we are beginning now to understand the extraordinary close parallels between how our bodies evolved and how our tools and rules evolve. Innovation is an evolutionary process. That's not just a metaphor, it's a precise description. I need you to re-examine a lot of your assumptions about how innovation happens, to disenthrall yourself of what you already know. First, innovation happens mainly by trial and error. It's a tinkering process, what the molecular biologist Francois Jacob called bricolage. And it usually starts with technology, not science, by the way, as Terence Keeley has shown. The trial and error may happen between firms, between designs, between people, but it happens. Here's my favorite example. If you look at the tail planes of early aeroplanes, there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of different designs being tried and eventually one is decided. It may not be quite as random as in genetic mutation, but it turns out that that does not matter. Here's the key paper by Henrik and the others, uh, which they make the point that even with semi-random uh, um, uh, mutation uh, in culture, you actually can get selection happening very quickly. Using mathematical models, um, uh, they make it clear that partial randomness is all that natural selection needs to start tinkering. In his excellent book, Adapt, 
Tim Harford, runs through some fine examples from the pacification of Iraq to the design of computer games of how much better innovation works when we embrace rather than reject this, when we let lots of different versions bloom and pick the one that works. Harford's thesis is that trial and error is a tremendously powerful process for solving problems in a complex world while expert leadership is not. In other words, intelligent design is just as bad at explaining innovation as it is at explaining evolution. Discovery comes from pluralism and serendipity, not command and control. The second point is that innovation is incremental and inexorable. We just don't make revolutionary leaps in technology and or culture. We make small adjustments to existing tools and rules. We discover and invent the adjacent possible, in Stuart Kaufman's phrase. If a particular invention is not impossible, then it's inevitable. The consequence of this is that our technologies and our institutions show dissent with modification, just like biological species. George Basala first drew attention to the startling evolutionary pedigrees of our common technologies. Here's an example of a technology family tree. The stone axe <coughs> gave way to the, oops, go on ahead there. The um, original Paleolithic stone axe gives way to the polished <coughs> Neolithic stone axe uh, on which design the first copper axe, that's Otzi's axe there, the guy in the Alps, um, then early bronze axes and then iron axes. But third, as well as being incremental and inevitable, cultural evolution is inexorable. In 1965, the computer expert Gordon Moore published his famous little graph showing that the number of components on a silicon chip, a measure of computing power, seemed to be doubling every year and a half. The technology guru Ray Kurzweil recently pointed out that a version of Moore's law has been true since the early years of the 20th century. And this is Kurzweil's graph. That is to say, before the integrated circuit even existed, the four previous technologies, electromechanical, relay, vacuum tube, and transistor, had all improved along the very same trajectory. The computing power that $1,000 buys has doubled every two years for a century. This law of accelerating returns appears to have marched imperturbably through the upheavals of the 20th century without breaking step. As Kurzweil points out, the reason for this predictability is that each technology is used to make the next. In other words, technology is driving its own progress by steadily expanding its own capacity to bring ideas together. We could not stop the march of technology even if we wanted to. Kevin Ke Kelly neatly captures this point in his book, What Technology Wants. Kelly points out that the many, many examples of simultaneous invention or discovery and the bitter priority disputes which result show that once an idea is ripe, it is inevitable. Darwin and Wallace being, of course, a classic example of that. Even relativity would not long have stayed unknown if Einstein had been run over by a tram. Lorentz was hot on the trail of the idea already. And this, of course, implies that inventors are dispensable. The phenomenon of convergent evolution, whereby different species end, end up looking remarkably alike, is a consequence of this. And convergent evolution happens in culture and technology too. Here's an example, the boomerang, invented in ancient Egypt and ancient Australia quite independently. So human innovation shows all the hallmarks of an evolutionary process. Descent with modification, variation, selection, Extinction and succession, competition, succession and extinction, and replication of successful forms. Notice that the cultural evolution I'm describing is the very opposite, by the way, of social Darwinism, the notion that we should order society so as to encourage biological evolution. Because bad ideas die in competition with good ones, people do not have to die. The more we allow our technologies and institutions to evolve, the more we can afford to keep the poor, the disabled, and the weak alive. This crucial point is often missed by my critics, especially the philosopher John Gray, who reviewed my book for the New Statesman and made this elementary howler, accusing me of social Darwinism. 
Cultural evolution makes social Darwinism less likely, not more. A country of grinding poverty and frequent warfare, 15th century England, say, or 21st century Congo, <coughs> is far more social Darwinist than a rich consumer society. But there is one ingredient missing from this story so far. One topic that biologists have spent a lot of time thinking about, but economists have not. And that topic is sex. Sex is what makes evolution a cumulative force, what makes it creative rather than conservative. Without the swapping of genes between individuals, you cannot get good mutations except through inheritance. Here's an example. Oh, sorry. Gone back. Out of order. Where's. Why did I shoot past it? There we go. Did I go too far forward then? <laughs> um, two mutations happen in an asexual species. They're both good, good mutations, one green and one red. And because the green one is better than the red one, so the red one has to go extinct. But now look what happens in a sexual species. At one point, an individual can inherit both the red one and the green one. So what sex does, it enables you to draw upon mutations that happen anywhere in your species. And you don't have to choose between them. You can get both. And this is one reason that sex is so widespread in the animal and plant kingdoms, despite being a costly and inconvenient business compared with vegetative growth and cloning. <laughs> Even the exceptions turn out to prove the rule. Deloid rotifers have not had sex for 80 million years. <laughs> but they are diverse, complex, and well-adapted creatures. So how do they manage to evolve without having sex? It turns out that they have a method of gene swapping that is, if anything, superior to sex. It's called horizontal gene transfer. Basically, they eat each other and borrow their genes. <laughs> <laughs> So my point is that evolution really got going when it invented sex. What's the equivalent, therefore, of sex in culture and technology? And the answer is, of course, obvious to a student of Adam Smith. <clears throat> Exchange. The habit of swapping one thing for another. Adam Smith, more than anybody else, spotted that exchange is uniquely a human characteristic. As he put it, no man ever saw a dog make fair and deliberate exchange of a bone with another dog. <laughs> and you know what? He was right about this. I've been going around the world trying to persuade biologists that only human beings indulge in exchange of objects. Why does it keep flicking on? It must have stopped. Anyway. Um, and services between strangers, and with little success. They're very resistant to this idea, but they just cannot come up with a good example to counter me. They tell me about symbiosis, in which two creatures work for each other, like a fungus and an alga in the form of a lichen, but that's between species, not between members of a species. They tell me about social insects, like ants, but that's between relatives, not between strangers. And they tell me about food for sex exchanges that certain insects and birds do, but that's not between strangers, it's within a mated pair. They tell me about reciprocity, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. But that's the swapping of the same favour at different times, not the swapping of different favours at the same time. So I stand by my argument, only human beings routinely exchange things between strangers. Only in human beings does culture have sex. Only in human beings is culture therefore cumulative and progressive. Exchange was the key invention that led to the explosion of technology and economic progress in our species. Not language, tools, or self-awareness, or big brains. We had all those for hundreds of thousands of years, and we remained rare and simple hunter-gatherers. It was when we invented exchange that the human revolution happened. Exchange is crucial to innovation. Innovation accelerates in societies that open themselves up to internal and external exchange through trade and communication. Ancient Greece, Song China, Renaissance Italy, 16th century Holland, 19th century Britain. Whereas innovation falters in countries that close themselves off from trade. Ming China, Nehru's India, Communist Albania, North Korea. Moreover, every innovation 
as Brian Arthur has argued, is a combination of other innovations. As LTC Rolt, the historian of engineering, put it, the motor car looks as if it was sired by the bicycle out of the horse carriage. <laughs> and here's my favorite example of this phenomenon, the pill camera, which takes a picture of your insides on the way through. It came about after a conversation between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. <laughs> Adam Smith, in other words, has the answer to an evolutionary puzzle. What caused the sudden emergence of behaviorally modern human beings in Africa in the past 100,000 years or so? In that surprisingly anthropological first chapter of The Wealth of Nations, Smith saw so clearly what was special about human beings was that they exchanged and specialized. Neanderthals didn't do this. They only ever used local materials. At this cave in Georgia, the Neanderthals used local stone for their tools. <coughs> they never used tools from any distance away in any Neanderthal sites. But when modern human beings move into this very same area, you find stone from many miles away being used to make the tools, as well as local stone. That means that moderns had access to ideas as well as materials from far away. Just as sex gives a species access to innovations anywhere in its species, so exchange gives you access to inno innovation anywhere in your species. When did it first happen? When was trade invented? At the moment, at the, moment the oldest evidence is from about 120,000 years ago. That's when obsidian axes in Ethiopia and snail shell beads like these in Algeria start traveling long distances. These beads are made from marine shells, but they're found 100 miles inland. And we know from modern Aborigines in Australia that long distance movement of man-made objects happens by trade, not migration. So it's not that people are walking all the way to the Mediterranean and picking up shells and walking all the way back again. They're getting them hand to hand by trade. Now that's 120,000 years ago, but I suspect it goes back further still, 10 times as, as old as agriculture trade is. There's a curious flowering of sophisticated toolkits in Africa around 160,000 years ago in a seashore dwelling population as evidenced by excavations at a place called Pinnacle Point. It came and went. But careful modeling by some anthropologists at University College London suggests that this might be a demographic phenomenon. That is to say, a rich food supply led to a dense population, which led to a rich toolkit. But that's only going to be true if there is exchange going on, if the ideas are having sex. Dense populations of rabbits don't get better tools. Once exchange and specialization are happening, cultural evolution accelerates if population density rises and decelerates if it falls. We can see this clearly from more recent archeology span in a study by Melanie Klein and Rob Boyd. In the Pacific, in pre-Western contact times, the sophistication of fishing tackle depends on the amount of trading contact between islands. That is to say, isolated islands, controlled for island size, will have simpler fishing tackle than well-connected islands. And indeed, if you cut people off from exchange networks, human progress not only stalls, it can go backwards. The best example of this is Tasmania, which became an island 10,000 years ago when sea levels rose. Not only did the Tasmanians not get innovations that happened after this time, such as the boomerang, they actually disinvented many of their existing tools. They gave up making bone tools altogether, for example. As Joe Henrik has argued, the reason for this is that their population was too small to sustain the specialization needed to collaborate in the making of tools, of some of these tools. Their collective brain was not big enough. Nothing to do with their individual brains, it's the collective intelligence that counts. <coughs> As a control for this idea, notice that the same thing did not happen in Tierra del Fuego. <coughs> the Chilean ambassador is here, so that's very relevant. Um, it, the Fuegan Indians continued to progress technologically. The reason for this is that the Magellan Strait is narrower than the Bass Strait, so trade continued 
and the Fuegan Indians had access to a collective brain the size of South America, whereas the Tasmanians had access to a collective brain only the size of Tasmania. Now for me, one of the most fascinating implications of this understanding of the collective brain is just how touchy-feely liberal it is. I'm constantly being told that to believe in markets is to believe in selfishness and greed. Yet I think the very opposite is true. The more people are immersed in markets, the more they collaborate, the more they share, the more they work for each other. In a fascinating series of experiments, <coughs> Joe Henrik and his colleagues showed that people play, who play ultimatum games, that is to say, this game invented by economists to try and bring out selfishness and cooperation, they play them more selfishly in more isolated and self-sufficient hunter-gatherer societies and less so <coughs> in more market-integrated societies. History shows that market-oriented, bottom-up societies are kinder, gentler, less likely to go to war, more likely to look after their poor, more likely to patronize the arts, more likely to look after the environment than societies run by the state. Hong Kong versus Mao's China, 16th century Holland versus Louis XIV's France, 20th century America versus Stalin's Russia, the ancient Greeks versus the ancient Egyptians, the Italian city-states versus the Italian papal states, South Korea versus North Korea, even today's America versus today's France, and so on. Example after example <laughs> of what Montesquieu called le doux commerce. As Voltaire said, go into the London Stock Exchange and you will see representatives of all nations gathered there for the service of mankind. There the Jew, the Mohammedan and the Christian deal with each other as if they were of the same religion and give the name of infidel only to those who go bankrupt. <laughs> So, as Deirdre McCloskey reminds us, we must not slip into apologising for markets, for saying that they are necessary despite their cruelties. We should embrace them precisely because they make people less selfish, and they make life more collective, less individualistic. If I had time, I'd like to have explored Vernon Smith's fascinating discovery, which was a mind-changer for me that asset markets are different from markets in goods and services. That asset markets in goods for resale are inherently prone to bubbles, where, so they are far less benign things than goods and services markets. But that's for another day. The entire drift of human history has been to make us less self-sufficient, more dependent on others to provide what we consume and to consume what we provide. We've moved from being, uh, uh, from being specialized as, uh, well, from consuming widely and, uh, sorry, from consuming as widely as we produce to being much more specialized as producers and much more diversified as consumers. That's the very source of prosperity and innovation. So it's time to reclaim the word collectivism from the statists on the left. The whole point of the market is that it does indeed collectivize society, but from the bottom up, not the top down. We surely know by now, after endless experiments, that a powerful state encourages selfishness. That seems to me to be the very point of public choice theory. Let me end with an optimistic note. If I'm right that exchange is the source of innovation, then I refuse to believe that the invention of the internet Here's a picture of the internet. That is quite literally a, an image made of sort of all the exchanges that are going on in the internet. It looks like a brain, doesn't it? And that's because it is a brain. The invention of the internet with its capacity to enable ideas to have sex faster and more promiscuously than ever is not raising, must be raising the, in, the innovation rate. And since innovation creates prosperity by lowering the time it takes to fulfill needs, then the astonishingly rapid lifting of humanity out of poverty that has happened all over the world, particularly in the last 20 years, can surely only accelerate. Indeed, it is accelerating. 
Much of Africa is now enjoying Asian tiger style growth. Child mortality is plummeting at the rate of 5% a year in Africa. In Silicon Valley recently, Vivek Wadia showed me a $35 tablet computer that we'll shortly be selling in India. Think what will, will be invented when a billion Indians are online. In terms of human prosperity, therefore, we ain't seen nothing yet. And because prosperity is an emergent property, an inevitable side effect of human exchange, we could not stop it even if we wanted to. All we could do is divert it elsewhere on the planet, which is what we in Europe seem intent on doing, by the way. <coughs> now, Adam Darwin did not invent emergence. His was an idea that emerged when it was ripe. And like so many good ideas, it was already being applied long before it was even understood. So I give you Adam Darwinism as the key to the future. Thank you very much. Indeed.